I can imagine a world where there's some kind of creative feedback from human to AI, where the human gets a cool idea based off something that the human could never have imagined. If it generates ideas or makes space, then humans will fill it. And that's cool. That's exciting. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Behind the Tech. I'm your host, Kevin Scott, Chief Technology Officer for Microsoft. In this podcast, we're going to get behind the tech. We'll talk with some of the people who've made our modern tech world possible and understand what motivated them to create what they did. So join me to maybe learn a little bit about the history of computing and get a few behind the scenes insights into what's happening today. Stick around. Hello, and welcome to Behind the Tech. I'm Christina Warren, Senior Cloud Advocate at Microsoft. And I'm Kevin Scott. And today, our guests are Ben Bloomberg and Jacob Collier in a bonus episode of their conversation with Kevin. If you didn't catch the first half of their chat in the last show, definitely have a listen. As many of you know, Jacob is a multi-Grammy award-winning instrumentalist, songwriter, arranger, and producer. He's up for three Grammys this year, including Album of the Year. And Ben is a creative technologist and recent PhD graduate from MIT. Jacob and Ben began their collaboration about six years ago and have partnered to create music and video and a one-man stage tour. Well, anyway, you just kind of need to jump onto YouTube and see for yourself because what they do is incredible. Yeah, you have no idea how excited I was to do this interview. Like, we've been trying to get Jacob on the podcast for a while. Uh, I am an enormous fan of his and have been for several years now. Uh, I I think like many people, I discovered him on YouTube where he began his musical career making these YouTube videos that were sort of visual and audio, just these rich, multi-layered experiences. Uh, Like everything from these sort of whimsical songs, like he made this video and a recording of the Flintstones and he won a Grammy for that, uh, like, Flintstones arrangement. But he's also, like, composed some incredibly compelling uh, new music. The thing that makes him relevant to this podcast, which is about technology, um, is that they use technology in such interesting ways to help Jacob realize his vision. And, like, part of that is, like, you know, how you put a song together that is so layered and interesting with, you know, so many vocals and so many instruments. Like part of that is like how you translate that into a live performance, which is very, very hard. And then part of that is like how he uses technology to create community and and to collaborate, which I think is really, you know, interesting. And he's sort of a, you know, like an internet native, a YouTube native, a social media native. And, you know, like he uses all of those things to incredibly good creative effect. So anyway, like I'm, I'm an enormous Jacob fan. As am I. Okay, so the conversation got started before we even had a chance to do our sound check, but it was too good not to share. So next up, you'll hear Kevin, Ben, and Jacob first jumping on the line together, and then we'll pick up with the bonus episode from their extended interview. Hello. Hey, Kevin. Hey, Jacob. Hey. And uh, and Ben, so nice to meet both of you. You too. This is really amazing nice and a, here, a privilege yeah. and a treat indeed. Oh goodness, it's uh, it's such a privilege for me. You uh, you have no idea how many of your videos I have uh, I've watched. Oh, uh, geez, Louise. My uh, my wife and children and I have been running around all summer long, uh, listening to All I Need, and it's uh, a variety of uh, iterations. <laughs> there have been a few different versions at this point. Um, that's amazing to hear. Yeah, it, I mean, it's really interesting. I, I was, um, when I was a kid, I was an enormous, uh, and I still am an enormous fan of classical piano. And one of my favorite pianists was Vladimir Horowitz. And he, you know, he had such a long performing career that he performed the same repertoire over and over and over again. But like, nothing was ever the same. Like other pianists, like everything, you know, had this consistency to it. And like his performances were just wildly different, sometimes just amazing. And sometimes like they were just total duds, uh, but he he just 
he was fearless. Uh, like, I don't even know if he was capable of performing the same thing the same way twice. How do you think about a performance? Like, they, they always seem to be, you know, mutating and, and changing, uh, you know, with, with you. Yeah, yeah. It's I guess it's something that you get addicted to after a while. You know, you can't do the thing you already did because that's already been done by you. So you have to find something new. And and Ben and I have been thinking in this way for, I guess, a, a few years. I guess since we met, you know, about six years ago now, whatever whatever it was. But you know, once once something has been done, you kind of seek the the edge of it, and then you you grow from there. You know, and so it's it's been a funny thing with all I need. But you know, I think it's eight or nine <laughs> eight or nine different versions. <laughs> variants of that song that that now exists and each one is, has 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 taught us something new and and each one is kind of evolves the, the song and evolves the concept and gives me a clue about what it is i like and what it is that you know that i want i want to i want to grow towards i guess i really love the uh you you added melodica to the uh uh to the what was it the jimmy uh jimmy kimmel uh, performance yeah right that, right. that was beautiful touch <laughs> <laughs> i appreciate it <laughs> Thank, thanks so much all right so that was a little bit of the behind the scenes you can just see how great that conversation was and we hadn't even started yet now let's get to the bonus episode focused on ai and creativity one of the things that i spend an enormous amount of my time on is AI. You know, we we are building very very uh, sophisticated systems for doing natural language and vision and speech, and uh, you know, in, increasingly AI is you know, becoming a, a systems problem almost at the largest scales. Uh, so like we're, we're building supercomputers to train models on. Um, but like one of the things that's happening from all of that investment is AI is getting used in more and more places. And, you know, I'm just really curious about how you all think about how AI plays a role in what it is that you're trying to create. You know, I, I've seen AI systems that can imagine performances, like whole, uh, like actual performances, uh, like in the style of Chopin or Rachmaninoff or like pick your thing. Uh, like, I'm not sure that's super interesting, but like there are other ways that uh, like AI is being used and like, you know, y- you guys is uh, like some of the best users of technology to create these experiences. I just love to love to hear how you think about it. Yeah, I I think that's really interesting um, because there's yeah there like you say there's so many people trying to use AI to create sort of uh, sort of quote unquote creative uh, performances or outputs um, and it's really interesting because a lot of these systems sort of the the success metric for them is not being able to tell the original from you know the or the output from the real thing i guess we could say um so it's sort of a it's sort of a copy and i think the big question that a lot of people have is whether it will ever get to the point where we value the ai for its own creativity rather than just sort of as an imitation um and you know one thing that we always say is you know whether it's uh, sort of style transcription or or um, you know, these, these models, Markov models and, and things that are combined to create these sort of very realistic, but not quite there, um, uh, representations of, of other things. All of that gets to what we would say is like maybe the 85th percentile of what we would call sort of good. Um, and I feel like when you get to creativity, I think somebody like Jacob or, or, or anybody who's, who's really coming up with with truly new and groundbreaking sort of material is it, it, that's all in the, in the upper 5% of, of sort of what, what we can do. And so, you know, as a toolkit, AI is really interesting um, to be able to sort of automate things that maybe would previously take a lot of work or would take a lot of, you know, drudgery. Uh, but I, I have yet to see an application where it's going to come up with something you know, necessarily truly new or 
or anything along the lines of, you know, like what Jacob would do, you know, we, where, where it's actually iterating. And, you know, of course there's these things like GPT three and, and, you know, even, even, um, like Sony CSL and, and uh, Francois Pachette's uh, flow machines where people have gotten really far. Um, and I, I think that has an application for like ads and cinema music and things where we're not sort of really zeroed in, dialed in on, on, you know, on what this is. Um, and, and then there's a whole, there's a whole, you know, genre of, of output where it's just completely surrealist. And, you know, you, you look at like the half bird, half cow, you know, or, or all these faces that get generated. And, um, and that's kind of its own thing. It's, it's different, you know, different, but, um, Jacob and I talk a lot about like, well, could we create a harmonic intelligence that sort of like encodes Jacob's sense of, of composition and, and sort of harmony into an AI. And I think we could do that as a compositional tool for other people to use, but whether, whether something is really going to actually be able to do what he does, um, in the in the best way that we could do it, it would just be an imitation of what he had done up until that point, and and that would never be enough. I think. <laughs> Have you guys seen? Uh, so Google Google did this really cool thing uh, called Blob Opera right around uh, Christmas, yeah. which is I think yeah. exactly what you're talking about. So it's it's more instrument than uh, you know like a thing that's trying to create an entire performance or creative experience um, and like that it's sort of how we think about AI as well like it's like I'm not trying to like God, God knows like I would never try to replace someone like uh, like Jacob because like you know the the, the precious, thing that we have in, in, in this world is our humanity. Um, like what I want is to create more tools and more instruments to help us be more human, to enhance that humanity. Uh, you know, not, not, you know, diminish it or like take the dignity away from it, uh, by, you know, sort of substituting for it. And, you know, I, I thought that blob opera, like in an artistic context was, uh, like an interesting thing. You know, they trained it from a bunch of professional opera singers' voices, and you know, like they they gave those voices an instrumentality for you know other people to play around with, which is interesting. I, I love it when it applies to play and when it when it gives you ideas. From my perspective, you know, the half cow, half cat thing is wicked. I love that. I mean, I, I love hybrid animal images anyway. I have like a soft spot for them, <laughs> but um, you know, I I think it's. It's really brilliant when it's not trying to be reasonable because then it breaks me out of my shell and something becomes possible for me that wasn't possible before that I wouldn't have thought of because I'm only a human. You know, that's cool for me. I think AI trying to be serious is is doomed to fail, partly because I think of the way that it would receive feedback, actually. If you if you go back to the feedback loop thing, if you if you put an AI on stage and and you give it an audience response, I don't know if it would be able to read that. <laughs> But, and I think that the amount of humanity that's needed to turn up and and care about all the different levels of that kind of empathy mixed with confidence, mixed with kind of fearlessness, mixed with doubt, mixed with inspiration, the sort of combination of elements there, you know, plus collaboration if you're on stage with other people. And even, you know, it's a bit like comic timing. You know, it's like, it's like, mm-hmm. does an AI get better than a human at comic timing? Because a lot of being on stage is about, this is the moment for this, or now is the moment for this in a, just a moment, or I'm just going to wait a moment longer so the audience can laugh again, or so the audience can feel what that meant, or whatever. Th- those, those kinds of, that to me is why I love touring, not because, you know, people buy more tickets, for example, to the shows, or because the applause is louder uh, after a particular song, or... There's more voices that sing along, you know, these kinds of things. And like, sure, these are metrics that I will judge the performance on to a point. Like, well, everyone was singing in that last song. I must have done a good job. But, but I actually, I think I just don't think an AI would would necessarily um, ever be subtle enough to, uh, and in some ways, imperfect enough to 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 care. You know, it, it takes a performer to be on stage and second guess what you're doing to make it special um, to a yeah. point. You know, you, if you go and parrot something, it doesn't. It doesn't work so well, and and that to me feels like one of the most fundamental differences is how, like how the 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 kind of consequence of a creative action 
is is reacted to and and how that how that's received and then and then changed because sometimes you stick and you say I'm not going to listen to you and you mm-hmm. flirt and and sometimes you say yeah okay I'll I'll go with you audience or or you say oh okay that's a good idea I'll move with that and sometimes you say um oh, you, you know what I mean it just it's so dynamic and and it's uh, so yeah. unable to be replicated and look and I think even even if you could build an AI that would do all of those things like what I'm chasing in music is goosebumps mm, yeah, and exactly if an ai gives me goosebumps it feels like manipulation uh whereas <laughs> if a performer gives me goosebumps it feels like connection right. and like I, I just don't even like even if you could have it which i i think you're right like it would be very 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 hard it's like i don't i'm not looking to be manipulated i want to be i want a connection I think when yeah. I get goosebumps, I I, I sense a, a, a fallibility in something that I relate to. I think that's almost that okay. that is often what gives me goosebumps. Is like, wow, and and you're and you're still shining anyway. You know, wow, so yeah, mucky yeah. and so shiny. Wow, I can't like I I see a part of myself in something's imperfections or in something's kind of power or in some I don't know you can't you can't articulate it you can't articulate yes. it. but AI by nature is not fallible because it's always the best iteration of itself well and it has to be articulated it, exactly yeah everything's already been articulated and so the the thing that's unspoken yeah and I think Kevin what what you said at the beginning you know we're trying to have the technology get out of the way and it's such a narrow balance of sort of feeling the, you know, getting those goosebump moments and not pulling people out of the sort of immersion. And, and that's very difficult. And that's, that's um, a very hard problem to quantify. There's a lot of unknowns and there's a lot of constraints. Yeah. On the other hand, if you can use something like AI to, you know, for, for example, with the, with the looping show, we always talk about giving Jacob 12 arms so that he can play 12 instruments at the same time. Um, that that starts to get interesting, or or maybe there's there's a there's a system out there now where you feed it a photo of a room and it gives you a reverb trail for that for Whoa. that room. Those tools start to start to be fun. Yeah, I think we're excited to explore that uh, going forward. Well, and it, look, I I think it, you know I'm I'm not a musician, so like I'm I I maybe what I'm about to say is just sort of nonsense, but. You know, it, it seems to me like there's just this distinct difference between a score and instruments and uh, and a performance. Um, you know, like I can listen to Murray play that, uh, you know, like that, that Chopin G minor ballad. Like I can get goosebumps at the moment. Like I can go look at the score and it's like, okay, like, you know, like I, and I have many, many times uh, like, all right, you know what is going on here that is giving me goosebumps and it's not the score. Cause like I can like put the score through a MIDI player and like it can, you know, robotically play the notes and it's like, all right, no goosebumps there. Uh, <laughs> you know, I can listen to a whole bunch of other performers play it. No goosebumps there. Like there's just something about like this very, like very complex that, you know, and, and it, it just be- feels deeply human. Uh, and like, I don't want a machine trying to replicate that. You know, but if a machine can come in and like help a human like produce more of that, like great. And and sometimes it can be helpful to to bounce off and to bounce an idea off against something that's neutral as well. You know, if I if I'm working on something and I share it with a friend of mine or someone in my family or whatever, then I I, I kind of risk their their judgment filtering into my overview of the song and then my mind being changed or or whatever. You know. And that doesn't change. Doesn't matter how old you are. You always have that slight fear when you show someone something that they might just say, "Oh, this is whatever." But I can imagine a world where there's some kind of creative feedback from human to AI, where the human gets a cool idea based off something that the human could never have imagined. If it generates ideas or 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 makes space, then humans will fill it, and that's cool. That's exciting. Yeah, it, you know, th- this is the other thing too about about AI. Like imagining an AI that was trying to compose a thing or deliver a performance the same way that you do. Like you, you know, one of the things that I think is very interesting about what you do is you 
don't always give people what they're expecting in a song. Like you, you will, you'll be sort of trucking along and it's like, okay, like, you know, here's the, here's what we expect. And then you will like do this harmonic thing. That's like, Oh crap. Like, why is there dissonance here now? And, (laughs) you know, and if, if you like the things that AI are really good at is sort of like reading, you know, reading, someone's response to a thing and like giving them more of what they want and like the the special thing that you do is like you are like challenging us to think more about the music by occasionally and strategically giving (laughs) us something that we're not expecting or like even literally making up new notes and like i just don't know how you like build the objective function or the feedback loop yeah Yeah. that's totally the challenge (laughs) it's a really individual dance isn't it like everyone has to do it there you know, my idea of what too much is or too dissonant or the right moment, like that changes all the time. Um, And I learn from things I like and from things I don't like and all this stuff. And, and then I just come out and I, and I'm a person, you know, and I think what can be moving about that, if it works well, is that a person is doing it all, you know, and, and as you say, you can take the same notes and something else can put them together in exactly that way. But something is kind of always lost. And and yeah, there's that, that funny dance between, you know, and I, I, suff- I, st- I struggle with this every single day when I, when I, when I write, it's like, how much do I give you what you want and pander to the, pander to the thing that will do well or people like, or is reasonable to do, or is, uh, makes, you know, it, it makes sense or, you know, and then how much do I, do I do the opposite? Do I push you in the, in the, in the other direction? And that push pull is, is magical you know it really is yeah. interesting H- have you guys uh seen this uh, there's a video of bobby mcferrin at uh, a neuro uh, science conference where they're they're sort of talking about you know what's built into our brains uh about music and he gets up in front of the audience and he like hums a note on the pentatonic scale and points at the audience and like he says nothing but he points to the audience and then they parrot the note back to him and then he does this thing where he he grounds that note on the pentatonic scale to a position and then he jumps and he goes to the next note on the scale and hums it and then points at the audience and they hum it. And then like they've got the pattern and then he like does this performance on the audience where as he's jumping, they just automatically know without <laughs> him having to hum it, like what the next set of notes are on the scale. And it's like the most incredible thing. It's like... And, and, you know, he says at the end of it that no matter where he goes in the world, he can do this same experiment with an audience and like they all have the pentatonic scale in their in their head. And so like we do have this expectation in our head about, you know, like what a musical performance is. Uh, and like, you know, I think the things that you do are sort of interesting in that uh, like you you sort of are pushing you know, that inbuilt uh, thing that we've got in our head in like very compelling ways, uh, you know, and again, like it's, I think it's just about like, you know, giving people a new lens on like something that biologically even they may uh, like just deeply understand and expect. I, I guess you could say the same for, for storytelling. Um, I love that that video of Bobby's. I, I was I was bowled over the first time I saw it and it gave me all sorts of ideas. Um but like I was going to say, it's the same with with stories in the sense that everyone kind of knows about you know departure and arrival, and and mm-hmm. everyone kind of knows about um, you know hate and love and and kind of yeah just I I guess tension and release in in a, in a primary color sense people people tend to feel that and so in some ways our job as artists is to it could be with a completely new set of materials. It could be like I'm going to lay out the, the the fundamental elements of this equation here. Like this is this is the the ground, the resting point, yeah. and then here is so and and these are the elements that are attached to that. And then and then maybe one of these elements is going to make a journey away to a different place. And this is the other. And then maybe there's some complication, or there's a tension, or a change of a change of speed, or something's inverted, or whatever. And and then you know something happens over here, and 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 eventually, you maybe move to a new place, or, or or maybe whatever. And then maybe at the end, you 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 come back home, and you you land home, and you think, oh, I remember, I don't remember what this feels like. This is yeah some kind of resolution. Yeah. Now, obviously, not all stories are like that, and 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 so forth. But I, I but think a lot, a lot of them are. I mean, like a lot it's, of them it's are very interesting. I mean, so 
you know, you, you have this Joseph Campbell, you know, here, hero with a thousand faces, you right. know, like so many of our stories like fit this pattern. And so like, there's just something, you know, again, like the pentatonic scale almost like it's, it's almost like we're sort of built in with yeah. this, uh, you know, this, this narrative framing of what a story ought to be, uh, you know, and on the one hand, that's amazing. And on the other hand, it's sort of depressing. Like you, you don't want to think that every story has to fit that pattern uh, in order to be interesting. Yeah, um, I think people just, people keep on iterating different ways of making tension and then releasing the tension. And that's like yeah. so interesting in an, kind of like an in, infinite way. And so it has unlimited potential for innovation and kind of new, new feelings, new, new spaces, new, new whatever. Ben, what do you think? I, I actually think that that's true for designing the for the production technology and the instruments as well, um, because you really, um, you know, you really are trying to create the sort of infrastructural pieces that that support that to the performance, um, and yeah, it, it, it you know you can you can spend all this time on engineering and trying to sort of get all of your details correct and in the end it's really about sort of supporting that kind of story and that kind of experience yeah and maybe maybe even building the infrastructure in a way i mean like i think you said this earlier like you don't want the instrument to dictate the performance uh like you don't want to make too many assumptions about what the performance is going to be uh you know that you are constrained by the instrumentality or the you know like the yeah, Yeah. yeah i don't know like this is fascinating. It's actually interesting. It's it's a funny balance because we, we sort of say, and this is sort of slightly related, um, is is that there's this balance between something being too obvious and sort of not obvious enough. Um, so when it comes to technology on stage, if you're if the audience can't tell how the technology is sort of connected to what the performer is doing and what the music is doing, that's not great because they'll get you know they they it's it's just confusing if it's really obvious that like you push this button and it makes that noise it's also it gets kind of boring really fast and so there's this middle ground where you're sort of playing with expectation um and you kind of draw people in and that's that's something that we chase like we we really are trying to find things that are complex in an interesting way and i i think in terms of building the harmonizer that was sort of the that was the most important piece um, is to find something that's sort of infinite in in very connected ways to to what Jacob is doing. So, so using the voice as an input, for example, is it does that because there's there's so much variability, um, sort of sort of continuous, and it's so directly connected to what to what Jacob's doing. Um, but it's also very clear what that connection is. Uh, so, mm. um, I think. That's a huge, huge thing that we that we care a lot about when when we're building all this stuff. Yeah, it's so fascinating. So um, we're we're almost out of time here. Although I could talk to you guys all day long. Uh, like this is so great. Um, but like may, maybe the last question I'll ask is um, you you did this um, fellowship or residency at MIT. I watched some of the video there. Like one of the things that you did is uh, you gave an orchestral performance of uh, Hideaway. And I don't know, Ben, like if you were uh, like, you know, obviously you were a PhD student at uh, MIT. Uh, like when, when did you defend your dissertation? Like recently? In February. Yeah. Or sorry, in, in November. Congratulations, man. That is Thanks. <laughs> unbelievably awesome. Uh, you should be so proud of yourself. Uh, like it's just great. Um, but <laughs> so like in, in, in that residency at MIT, like I, I, for me, like I felt like you just did this incredibly moving thing like hideaway is uh you know like i've watched a bunch of your videos before and i'm like oh my god these are like so interesting and entertaining and like hideaway was like moving like i i you know i I don't know what it is like the lyrics the you know the it's just and then translating that to like this orchestral thing with this big group of people and you know like there's you know it's just, uh, it's super interesting. Did you realize that there was something special going on with that song? 
and and that whole experience of of creating a thing with so many people um i didn't think too much about it honestly i i i think i i knew the song was special when i wrote it because it felt like i was opening a real door to my own creative process because i'd never done anything like that before i never really written a song <laughs> funnily enough it was it, i was almost like i said well what if i gave myself permission to just write a song and and like like a few times I've done this, it starts being kind of simple and then it ends up being kind of complex um, and and detailed and, and stuff. And so it starts with this kind of simple melody and then and takes you on this this other journey and it moves away. And I was very excited about that. And it felt like I was touching something that felt new and felt interesting. And it was a real, you know, like you know, when you're just you've gone further out on a limb than you've ever gone and you're just walking and you don't know where you're gonna go. That feeling in an idea. It was a special moment with Hideaway. Um and you know, I remember Ben when we when we sit and when, when we sat and and put together in my room and, and we were mixing everything and we were thinking about how that song felt. You know, we we both kind of felt that this was a song that we that, that we loved. Um, but I, I think our job at that point was just to see the song as what it was and make it sound good on the album, which I, I think we you know we, we did. Um, the, the orchestral arrangement thing was was such a it was like a whole nother level um, because I've sat in my room and made music and done it kind of uh, alone for so long and the feeling of taking a song like hideaway which is almost about that space about this space of of making music here and being alone and the trust within that and the questioning within that and the all that and to take that and to to kind of rock up on the other side of the world and and have such wonderful kind of enthusiastic warm-hearted people who are who are there to play it it was really 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 crazy for me because you know, it, it's it's important to remember that at that time I had very little experience with meeting anybody who had ever listened to my music outside of my friends. You know, I'd basically just left home, <laughs> kind of thing. It's like I was just, you know, I, I mean, when I when I went to meet Ben, that was my first flight alone without my mum ever. You know, to the states in 2015, and and it was only only about a year later that we were doing those those songs in in Kresge Hall at, at, at MIT, and and. It's a spectacular feeling, and and you feel very very small and very big at the same time. You know, you feel like your your kind of you know your your values are resonating quite literally in a space filled with people, but you feel like you're one of a great number, and that the whole thing is much bigger than you are. And and so there's it's it's a mixture of of kind of humbling and and joyous and I suppose a, a, almost like a celebration of of what what life is about. And you know, you slave away at these. <laughs> ideas, these songs, these concepts, these, um, you know, technological accompli- accomplishments, you know, these things that, that we build and dream up. And then, and then there's a moment where you have to take your hands off the wheel and say, well, okay, let's, let's put this into the world and, and see what happens. And, and, and let's see what people make of it. And I, I remember, you know, playing Hideaway. I will, I'll never forget playing Hideaway at that particular gig. And it was really slow. We did it really, really slowly. We did it way slower on the gig than we'd ever done it in rehearsal. It was like 30 BPM, you know, really slow. But it felt really special and really good. And we were kind of swimming in the in the spirit of it. And it's almost like the moment where you look back and you say, oh, so that's what the song was about. Because I didn't know until now, you know. And you have to kind of jump into the water, see what happens with something to be able to look back and say, huh, that's what it was all about. You know, it. it this is one of the things that I love so much about music because there's just this mysterious element to it. Like we can talk about all of the things like the harmony, uh, the music theory, the technical aspects of playing the instruments, like the software, the harmonizer, the mixing. But, you know, then you have this performance, right? Um, and, And there's a handful of things in music that literally give me goosebumps, like right, right down my spine. Um, and, you know, the, it's just a handful. So Murray Pariah uh, playing Chopin's uh, G minor ballad, like right around bar 63, where, you know, like the tension's building up and then it just like blows out like goosebumps every time. Uh, like Mozart's uh, the adagio, like beginning of the adagio for the, uh, the clarinet concerto, like goosebumps every time. And like that performance of Hideaway, uh, like goosebumps every time. And I can't, I can't explain it. I don't know why. I don't know why it's uh, like that performance and not the video. Uh, I don't know why it's that song and not not others. Uh, 
And it's, it's, I, I don't even understand what's going on there, but it's like something, something that like, obviously like there's, something neurobiologically going on in your brain uh, and it feels like a connection uh, and it's incredibly special. And like, I don't think anybody knows how to replicate it. uh, And it's just great. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Thanks so much for saying that. Yeah. I I was, I was goosebumps all over it in performance, um, which is, which is always a sign that I'm doing something right, you know, but I, as, as Ben and I try to try to think about things sometimes, I, I think we just sort of follow our goosebumps into into in, into the next thing that we're doing, you know, and it's like, well, I'll, I'll follow, I'll follow it and see where it, see where it goes. And well, we don't know, you know, no one knows. And I think if there's one thing that the past 12 months has taught us, it's that whatever you think you knew, you, you don't know, but, but you can still turn up, you know, and, and you can still find joy in stuff and you, and you can still play. Yeah. It's so fascinating. Um, again, like I could, I could talk all day, uh, with you all again, I'd love to love to meet you all in person and, uh, and just, spend spend a bunch of good time uh, chatting oh yeah that sounds sounds brilliant i would i'd love to i'd absolutely love love to yeah yeah thank you thank you well that was kevin's conversation with ben bloomberg and jacob collier kevin you didn't talk too much about ai in your conversation although you were talking about technology and how things have evolved but i was just curious from your perspective I don't know if you've seen the jukebox project from OpenAI. It's basically a neural net that generates music. And I was curious if you had any thoughts about that project or projects like it and how those worlds could interact in the future with people who are doing and creating things like the work that Ben and Jacob are so good at. Yeah, I, I think it's an incredibly interesting space. We, we got into it a little bit right at the very end of the of the episode and like maybe that's the you know the next episode if we can persuade them to uh to be back on i i think that these ai technologies have an enormous potential to help power the creativity of artists and entrepreneurs and makers of all ilks and you know jukebox is really interesting um you know, one one of the things that we talked about is, um, to me, the, the application of that AI will be most interesting when it puts a tool into the hands of a creator that helps them to expand their creative possibilities and opens up their horizons to new things that they couldn't do before. Yeah. Um, the the thing that's not interesting to me is like things that you're trying to do where you make the AI itself like the sole creative right. agent. Right. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. And and I I would I think it'd be great if we could have Ben and Jacob back to talk more about that because I totally agree with you. It's not that interesting for the AI to be the creator, but if the AI could be used to make the tools better so that the output could be even more new and different, that could be really, really special. Yeah, and and look, I think we're at the point now where the tools are capable of a lot. Things like jukebox, and like there've been been a few other experiments. Like we've even done uh, done some things at Microsoft Research, and I know Huawei uh, has done a few interesting things where you can have an AI now compose a. a a piece of classical music in the style of your favorite composer. You can say. Yeah, write me a piano piece that's uh, in the style of Rachmaninoff or Chopin. And it can do something that is stylistically very much like Rachmaninoff or Chopin. And and you just sort of listen to it the first time. You're like, wow. Um, There's this um, uh, YouTube channel called Two Set Violin uh, that are these two uh, professional violinists who um, like comedically have these conversations on YouTube about classical music. And uh, on one of their episodes, they looked at, I think, that Huawei AI that was trying to write the third movement of Sh- Schubert's Unfinished Symphony. <laughs> and and like it's just sort of staggering, like, what the AI did. Like, it, uh, you know, it, in that third movement, like, really picked up the, the, uh, you know, the sort of the stylistic things that made Schubert 
special and and like gave him a unique voice as a composer whether or not the thing was compelling like who knows uh but you know i I think what we really need to do is to get these tools into the hands of artists who will actually figure out the interesting things to do with the technology 100 percent, 100 percent, and that's that's the thing that makes me excited as somebody who loves both music and art All right. Well, that's all for today. We were so delighted to have Ben and Jacob on the show. So thank you again to both of them. Send us a message anytime at behindthetech at microsoft.com. And thank you for listening. See you next time.